we've been looking at the topic of things to come. <clears throat> things to come. When I was a teenager, uh, this is the thing that really uh, sparked me into Bible study. I read the, the, the book of Daniel, and Daniel is just like loaded with prophecies. And uh, as I was reading, uh, I saw that there were some that were fulfilled prophecies. So I asked if I could make my term paper in English uh, at my first year of college on fulfilled prophecies from the book of Daniel because it was history and it was a history course. And then he said yes, and I did that. And I got so intrigued in Bible prophecy. Oh, my goodness. So that I discovered that not all of the prophecies have historically already been fulfilled. Actually, about a quarter of the Bible is yet to be fulfilled. These are prophetic elements that are going to happen in the future. And I have been a student of prophecy pretty much my whole life on and off. And we've been looking at uh, this whole idea of, <clears throat> from just the perspective of the church. Uh, what is going to be happening in the future? Because we are the church. Jesus had predicted the church itself. In the Old Testament, there is no church. Jesus says in Matthew 16, I will build my church. So at that moment, there was no church. At that moment, he is saying, it's in my blueprint. I'm going to build a church in the future, and it's going to be a whole new community that's going to be my church, my community. Well, we know that Jesus Christ then died for our sins, and he was buried, and he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and it was still, there was no church. It wasn't until after Jesus ascended into heaven on the first day of Pentecost in, in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit came down and baptized the believers there into the body of Christ, which was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, and he became, we became the church. And the church has been going on ever since Acts chapter 2. Jesus has been building his church, and we're just a part of that. Well, you know, Jesus had said before he ever died, was buried, and rose from the grave, and then before the church had even started, he told his disciples in the upper room, he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, if I go and I leave, I go and prepare a place for you. He said, I will come back and take you to be with me. Now, that coming back to take us to be with him is something totally new. You never read about that in all of the Old Testament. But that Jesus would come back in the air and gather us out of, the, out of this world who are alive and take us to be with, with him forever in the air. Everywhere in the Old Testament was much different. That he was going to come and he was going to land on the Mount of Olives and that he was going to set up a kingdom that would last for a thousand years. Well, I know the thousand years because Revelation says it's that long, but he was just going to establish a kingdom. We have that all taught. But this is something new that Jesus said, that the church... Now, I got the church all stretched out there. You see that in the diagram? Because the church is going on, has been going on for 2,000 years, but one day Jesus is coming back and when he does, those who are alive will be caught up. Those who have already died will be caught up. The dead of Christ shall go first. And then there's going to be this great reunion. We're going to go into heaven and be with the Lord forever. It's awesome. Now, what are we going to do when we get to, the, get to heaven? Well, it says, after the rapture, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ is a place where you get your reward for how you lived your life. Now, you go to heaven because you know Jesus. You believed in him as your savior, your personal savior. You've gotten saved, born again. You've become a new creature in Christ. You believe in Jesus in this life. And so you go to heaven because of that. But what you've done in this life is going to be rewarded. And it's at that point when we are raptured, we go to heaven to be with the Lord, that he is going to reward us for what we have done. Meanwhile, the question is, what's going on on earth while we're being rewarded in heaven? Well, the day of the Lord is beginning. We started looking at that last week. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, Apostle Paul says. And we explain that the day of the Lord is like the, the, <clears throat> the Jewish day. The Jewish day begins in the evening, 6 o'clock in the evening, and it goes through a period of darkness, and then it is morning, and you go through a period of daylight. We think of it just the opposite, because we're Western thinkers. We think of it... Oh, it's daylight, then it's nighttime. Not so. In fact, if you were to read the book of Genesis, you would find in Genesis 1, 1, or Genesis chapter 1, <clears throat> that it says that it was, more, it was evening, and then it was morning, day one. You read a little bit further. It was evening, and then morning, day two. The concept of the day of the Lord is not a 24-hour day. <clears throat> it is an age. 
an age of darkness before a time of light. It is the age of tribulation, distress, problems, pain. Jesus calls it labor pain. It's like all creation is having labor pain. And you know how that works. It gets more intense, more intense, and then it gets really excruciating till the baby is delivered. And that is the kingdom. And so he's telling us there's a period of trouble coming, this period of trouble. Well, while we are in heaven on earth, tribulation is going on. While we're being rewarded, trials and tribulation, you think you've got problems? Oh, Jesus tells us all about those problems. In fact, while we're in heaven, we looked at last week in chapter 24 of Matthew, and we're starting to go through Matthew 24, 25. And as we are in Matthew, we found that there's a period of time coming when, when the church is gone, that there's going to be deception everywhere. People are going to be saying, hey, this is the Messiah, here's the Christ, and they're lying. He went on to say, after that, there's going to be a period of wars and rumors of war. And we looked at many of those. In fact, we looked at the initial phase of this, where there's an invasion into the land of Israel of at least six nations, but it says, and many other nations too, they invade the land of Israel. There's war. It's followed by a period of famine. That is followed by a period of martyrdom, seeking out the believers in Jesus Christ and martyring them, killing them executing them. It's followed by an apostasy where people's hearts are turning away from the Lord, trying to save their own hide, abandoning the Lord, and leaving the true and living God. There's going to be a period of cold-heartedness. People's hearts are going to be hard-hearted even towards family members. And it says there's going to be a time also of a great awakening. If you read in the book of Revelation, you know there's 144,000 witnesses and they're going around preaching and there's a great multi people, multitude of people who come to Jesus as Savior at this period, and, but they do so by giving their life. They are martyred for Jesus Christ. Jesus calls this the beginning of sorrow. And where we left off last time, we said we were now towards the middle of this period of time called the tribulation, the middle of the tribulation. And I want to just kind of pick up there. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, uh, 15, So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Well, that's pretty interesting. The question is, what is this he's talking about? The abomination of desolation, and it's not simply when you read over those words, you say, well, I don't know what they are, and I just keep going. Shh. I just keep reading. The whole idea is, whoa, stop. I want you, the reader, to understand what this is that he's talking about. And so in order to do that, I think we have to go back to Daniel chapter 9, to the very first reference and there's three references to the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel. And there's one here in Matthew and one also in Luke five times in the whole Bible. And Jesus says, whoa, put on the brake, stop. I want you to know what I'm talking about. Not just to read it, to understand it. So I, I try to jump in this. Daniel has been in captivity and he's read the book of Jeremiah. And Jer Jeremiah predicted that they would be in captivity 70 years. And Daniel's done a little calculating, said, Psh, the 70 years are almost up. It's time for us to return. And so he starts confessing the sins of the nation Israel so that the Lord will return them to captivity as a righteous nation. God sends an angel, and the angel is Gabriel, and Gabriel tells him that, and we're going to pick up here. We're jumping into context. 77s. Get that? 77s. All right, if you take that and multiply that, that's 490. I know that's 490 years because of the context. He's been praying about the 70 years of captivity. So we got 490 years. He says 490 years are decreed on your people. Now he's talking to Daniel, and Daniel's a Jewish boy who's in captivity in Babylon. And so we know that he's talking not about the Babylonians, he's talking about the Jews. And these 490 years are determined on your holy city, which is Jerusalem. Every day, Daniel would get up, face towards Jerusalem, and he would pray. And you remember, because he was praying like that, he got thrown in the lions, and you know the story. But Daniel, he knows that this is his holy city, Jerusalem, and the, the angel's telling him, 
490 years are decreed. Now, first thing you've got to know is that if there's 490 years, there's going to be four more, 490 more years of the, of the history of Israel, okay? He knows that now because the angel just told him that. But notice what he says here. He says there are six things that are going to be accomplished by the end of that 490 years. To finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. 490 years and this will all be done. What he doesn't know is it's going to be in two comings. The first coming of Jesus Christ, which we're going to celebrate in December, that Jesus came as a baby, was born king of kings, and that Jesus lived and he died to finish paying the full price of transgression. He put an end to sin. Jesus said, it is finished on the cross. And to atone for wickedness. Jesus is our, our atoning sacrifice, according to 1 John 2. So he's talking about the first coming of Christ, and he's also talking about the second coming of Christ. Because he's going to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, you and I both know we're not in an age of righteousness right now, right? Anybody watch 24-7 news? Is there anything righteous on the news? No, we're not in everlasting righteousness. We're not. We're in a terrible time. But when this 490 years are over, righteousness is going to be prevailing everywhere. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is going to rule in glory. To seal up the vision, Daniel has gotten these visions in the book of Daniel, and they're going to be sealed up. That's going to be finalized. And the prophecy, some of them were visions, some were dreams, and some were prophetic utterances. He's saying it's all going to be finalized when the 490 years are over. And then the last one, to anoint the most holy. Most theologians think that is to anoint the most holy place called the temple, which means Jerusalem is going to have another temple in the future because if this has not yet been completely fulfilled they're going, and it's going to be fulfilled in the future, then there's going to be another Jewish temple built where the Dome of the Rock is today or maybe right next to it because some archaeologists have discovered that it is not exactly on the same place as the original Solomon's temple. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. 490 years to seal up all the prophecies, the prophetic words regarding the Jewish people in this age and bring them into the next age of true righteousness and the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Then he adds these verses. And this is where it gets to what Jesus is talking about. He said, no one understand. You notice it's very interesting. Jesus said, read and understand. Here he's saying, know and understand. I want you to know this, he says. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now that decree was given by Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, to Nehemiah that he could go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in 445 B.C. Isn't that interesting? We can, we can nail that right down. We know the exact year that, that that happened. He said, from that until the anointed ruler comes, that is the Messiah, the Christ, the king of the Jews, until that time, he says, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. Or if you add those all up together, there's going to be 69 sevens, and that 69 sevens is going to be a total of 483 years. You notice what's missing? The prophecy was for 490 years, and he had only given us 483 years. And so, where's the other seven years? Oh, the other seven years are yet to come. They're yet to come. Very interesting, this prophecy. He then adds this little line. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench. I think he's talking about the seven sevens, or 49 years after the decree, the city will completely be rebuilt. When it talks about the streets and the, the trench, the different commentators on this say it has to do with the wide space in the plaza where you sit in judgment, conduct business of the city and the city gates. Something like that. And although Nehemiah quickly rebuilt the walls, patched them all up in like 52 days, it took a while until they got the complete city 
restored to where it should be. It took that amount of time. He said, but it will be rebuilt in troublesome times. Yes, they were constantly being harassed by the Canaanites within the area, but the job was completed. The job was completed. Now he goes on in the next verse, and he says, and after the 62 sevens, which followed the seven sevens, okay, he says, after that, the anointed one, the Messiah, that's the word anointed means Messiah, which we also translate into the Greek, Christos, which in, translates into English, the Christ. He says here, after those 62, which follow the seven, Christ will be cut off. Did you notice that, cut off? He doesn't say during the period, but he says after it. So it's going to happen after the 483 years, the Messiah will be cut off. And the text says, and we'll have nothing. Actually, one way of understanding this, which I think is the accurate way, is there is nothing wrong in him. He dies as an innocent lamb of God. The word cut off is a, a, a verb in the Hebrew that has a violent death. Can you imagine anything more violent? than a crucifixion, dangling and hanging on nails, pierced in the side, thorns on your head, back beaten so thoroughly before you ever got there. It's this, he's cut off and he has nothing. The anointed will be cut off. That happens after the 483 years. Then he says something that's really interesting. The next line is so important. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Notice. It's not, he says, the ruler destroys the city and the sanctuary. He says the people will destroy this, the city and the sanctuary. What he is saying here is there's going to happen in the future after, after the, the 69 or the four, 69 units of seven, the 483 years, what's going to happen after that, two events he, he records. Messiah is cut off, he's crucified, and the city of Jerusalem is destroyed by a people in the future. Now, as Daniel's writing this, all right, uh, he, he's been in captivity. He's writing this. He, he's under Babylonian dom domination. He hasn't even heard of this group of people called the Romans. They're a future people. They're a future people. And so he says here, the people who will destroy the city, who are those people? We know who destroyed the city. In 70 A.D., the Romans under General Titus came in and he destroyed the city, totally raising it, scraping the very top of it. Because they burned part of it and the gold had melted, it got in the cracks, they took the very stones off and threw them off the top, utterly destroying the city of Jerusalem and the sanctuary. So we know who the people are, but what is really crucial here, so when it says the people, we can say, and the Romans will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Because we know who they are. We live on the other side of this event. At the same time, he says it's the people of the ruler who will come. It wasn't Titus, because he was talking about those people who destroyed it were the Romans. But a future ruler, an end-time ruler, a ruler yet to come in the future, that ruler that he is going to destroy the sanctuary in the city, there is this future ruler. We're going to look at that more in the next verse. He says, but at that time... The end will come to the city with a flood. There's going to be a war. Titus waged this war on the city, and it will continue to the end till it was very destroyed. He raised it, and it was all because of the decree of God. God had rendered it certain. Listen, folks. For the Jews, it couldn't have got any worse. But God is a God who's got the whole world in his hands. And I don't know what you're staring and facing right now, and you think this is like the worst it could possibly be but he's got the whole world in his hands. We go to the next verse. Uh, I just want to put this before we do. I want you to notice that between Christ dying on the cross, the very same year, Jesus died on the cross, was buried and rose again. Fifty days later, we have Pentecost, and the church age begins, and the church age has been going on. It has gone past the destruction of Jerusalem, and it is still going on. And that last seven years has not yet taken place. Once the church is raptured, I believe at that point, we're going to have that one seven that was left over in this verse. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. There is one unit of seven years that is yet in the future to be fulfilled. He says, in the let me just back up. 
it starts with a confirming of a covenant. Most believe that the Roman, that is, future Roman guy that's supposed to come, he signs a peace agreement with the nation Israel so that the nation Israel, as we saw last time, is dwelling in a city without defenses, villages without walls. They're defenseless. They're relying upon this future Roman, or shall I say, leader of the Western world, because that's what the Romans were, the Western world. The leader of the Western world, they're, they're leaning on him to defend them. They sign a peace treaty for a, a seven years, is what most people believe is what's going on here. We got this treaty for seven years, and so Israel's dwelling in peace and safety. But that's what it says, when they dwell in peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction. Something happens. Now notice it says, he will. The he's antecedent goes back to that future Roman ruler. It says the, the people of the king who will come, this future king who will come, he is going to be the one who confirms a covenant. Now this is telling us a lot of information. The Roman Empire or the Western world is going to take dominance in the future. There's going to be a king who's going to arise and he's going to enter into a treaty with the nation Israel. Part of that treaty is going that they can resume their worship in Israel of uh, sacrifice, sacrifice. It also assumes in this whole passage that there's going to be a future temple in Jerusalem among the Jews. All these things are prophetic. It's part of that 25% of the Bible that has not yet been fulfilled. It says, he will confirm a covenant with many for seven years, one unit of seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to the sacrifice. They've got this temple reinstated in this peace treaty and they're, they're offering their sacrifices. In the middle, he stops it. Some people say that he breaks his agreement with them. Others say, no, he is just changing the, the terms of the treaty. Nope, you can't do that anymore. If you want my protection, now you've got to stop it. You've got to stop it. Then he does, here's what Jesus is talking about. I've been telling you all of this to get to this one point. You still with me? He says, on the wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. The question is, what is the abomination that causes desolation? In chapter 11, I believe it's verse 31, chapter 11, 31, there was another historical prophecy about an abomination of desolation that has already been fulfilled. There was a guy by the name of Antiochus. He was a king of Syria, the Seleucids. And he was waging war against the Ptolemies in Egypt. And he pretty much conquered them. Except the Romans wanted it as a prize too. And the Romans said, you better get out of Dodge or you're done. So he fled and he gave Egypt over to them on his way back. He is so frustrated as he's going through the land that he's taking out all of his anger on the Jews. So he goes into Jerusalem, make a long story short of all the things that he did. He was a wicked, wicked man. He slaughtered a sow, a pig, on the altar. Now, if any of you know anything about the Jewish religion, the pig is about as unclean an animal as you can get. And he slaughters it on the altar of the Jews, desecrating the temple. Then he set up a statue, the statue of Zeus. You see, Antiochus had changed his name to Antiochus Epiphanes because his dad's name was Antiochus too. And he was like the fourth or fifth down the line. And so he changes his name to Epiphanes, meaning the manifestation of God. This guy believes he is God, Zeus. Kind of a crazy man, wouldn't you say? Instead of Epiphanes, the haters of this guy, his opposition, changed a few letters in the name and said instead of being a manifestation of God, it changed the word to being a madman. Madman. He was a madman. And, but he thinks he's God. He desecrates the temple by putting the pig on the altar and then by setting up a statue of Zeus in the temple of the Lord. Desecrated the temple. And he says... Until the end, that's going to last till the end. That man's going to stand there till, till what? Until that which is decreed is poured out on him. God has an end for him. Can I just like to jump to the end on that? 
He's cast into the lake of fire that lasts forever and ever and ever. I know that from reading the book of Revelation. Whoa. Jesus, okay, this is all my introduction. You are filling out all your notes. You notice right now that you haven't filled out a single blank, right? Oh, said, preacher, help us. Before we get to the fill in the blanks, here we go. From the time of the daily sacrifices abolished in the end times, the abomination that causes desolation is set up from that time. There will be 1,290 days. Now, in the prophetic years of the book of Daniel, they used the old Jewish calendar of a 360-day year, not a 365-day, 12 months of, th of, of 30 days each. And so when you calculate this out, it turns out to be exactly three and a half years. And so we are exactly in the middle of the tribulation period when this happens. I know that. And the tribulation is going to be marked by this abomination that is set up, the abomination of desolation. For Jesus said... The church is gone. We're receiving all of our, our rewards in heaven, but on earth, we got this period of time of birth pangs like labor. They start out small, just contractions. They're getting worse and worse, and it's more so severe that all of a sudden hard labor kicks in. And there is a time, he says here, when that abomination of desolation set up, you're in the midst of tribulation like the world's never seen. He's going to go on and tell us about that. He says, so when you see that, you know that you're in the middle of it. Let's keep going. You know when, when, when that end time character desecrates the temple with having that pig slaughtered or whatever he does and he sets up his statue. Now I've read the book of Revelation and I know from Revelation chapter 13 that there are two wicked individuals at the end time. One is called the first beast. The other one's called the second beast. The first beast, I believe, is the guy that's going to be this end time Roman revived leader of the Western world. And the second beast is going to probably be the prime minister of Israel. And these two are working and negotiating a seven-year contract. And what they're going to do in the middle of that, the one leader, the first beast, is going to end everything in an agreement with the prime minister of Israel at the end times. He's called the false prophet, a false prophet. And the false prophet's going to make a statue, it says. And he's going to have miraculous powers. I don't think they're coming from God, but maybe from Satan. And he is able to make his statue breathe. Very interesting. It's almost not like it's a, a bionic person but a bionic machine that has got some humanistic qualities and characteristics to it. He erects this thing in the middle, and everybody has, it's called, it's called the image of the first beast, so it's going to probably look like him, and everybody's supposed to worship the first beast because of this. This is going on on that level at that particular time. Now notice what Jesus said. Now when you see this happening... The middle of the tribulation is marked by urgency. Get out of Dodge. When you see the abomination that causes desolation, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down and take anything out of the house. Let no one who is in the field go back to get his coat. In our case, it would be, hey, oh, I forgot my cell phone. <laughs> right? He said, don't go back for your cell phone. You don't have time. You've got to get out of there. Why? If you thought martyrdom before that was great, it's going to get more severe at this point. Watch as we go on. How dreadful it will be in those days for a pregnant woman. Why? Well, she can't exactly run. And the nursing mother, why? She's carrying the baby. How are you going to run to carrying your nurse and the baby? Pray that your flight will not be in a, in a place... <laughs> In the winter or on the Sabbath day. Why? On the Sabbath day, they had the rabbinic laws that you could only do a Sabbath day journey, which was you could only walk two miles. Well, you're really not going to get out of Dodge very fast. The fast, far, furthest you can go is two miles. Listen, he's saying, this is going to be a dreadful time. Watch. He says, it is going to be marked by severity. How dreadful it will be. For then there will be great distress. I'm using the New International Version. The Old King James Version has this right here. Great tribulation. That's why this period is called the tribulation because King James Version was used longer than any other translation in the history of translations, I think. 
And people have picked up that Jesus coins this term here. Modern translators translated great distress. Here it's translated great tribulation. He's talking about this time. He says it will be dreadful because there will be great tribulation unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. This is the most severe time in world history. Just a casual reading through the book of Revelation that covers the same period of time. You find during the trumpets that one quarter of all humanity dies. Then in the next chapter is when he gives out the, the that's, that was during the seals. And the trumpets then he's given out, he says one third of that group dies. So by the time you're done, you take, take one quarter, then you take a third. You're left with half the human population is dying through all the severity of what's going on in this time. Notice what he says in verse 22. If those days had not been cut short, no one would have survived. But for the sake of the elect, God's chosen one, his people, those days will be shortened. I'm not sure what it means by shortened, if he's meaning that to three and a half years, he could have let this go on further than three and a half years. Or if he's saying that daylight hours are cut short, so the days are just shortened. They're shortened because God is just shortening now the days so that uh, his people can survive to the end. This is marked by unequal severity. It's marked by imposters. At that time, if anyone says to you, oh, look, here he is. Here's the Christ. Oh, there he is. Don't believe it. False Christ, false prophets will appear and they will perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I've told you ahead of time how severe it's going to be. <clears throat> it's going to be severe. So then, he says, so if anyone tells you, there he is. No, that's not him. That's an antichrist. He's out in the desert. Do not go there. Or here he is in the inner room. Do not believe it. Wow. Finally, this beginning with the middle of the tribulation, all these things that are happening, you can read more in the Bible from Daniel, Revelation. Finally, he says, as the lightning comes from the east, and you can see it in the west, speed of light, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. He brings us to the end of this dark, dreary period of time that he said, I want you to understand it's seven years long in the middle of it. He said that it's going to get really intense for the last three and a half years, but then when you see that flash in a moment, twinkling out of an eye, the speed of light, as fast as lightning flashes, he says, <clears throat> so will be coming of the Son of Man. And where there, are, there is a carcass, there will be vultures that will gather. That, I believe, is talking about the Battle of Armageddon. We'll pick up with that next time. All I want you to see here is what we've been looking at. In the middle of the tribulation, there's an abomination. After that, there's an urgent flight. You've got to get out of Dodge. And then there's this dreadfulness, a period of so dreadful, with, the, with severity of pain and anguish for all who are in it. He goes on and he says, there's imposters who are going to arrive and pretend to be your Savior as lied to you. And there's going to be the Antichrist who will be very obvious at that particular time. And it's all going to wrap up with the second coming. And I come to this. There's going to be that second coming of the lightning flashing from the east to the west. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. All right, so what do we take away from all this? Obviously, this was written for people who will live after we're gone. We're in heaven receiving our reward. So, so what do we take away from God putting this in the Bible and saying, I want you not just to read it, I want you to understand this. What do we take away? First of all, I want you to take this away. God will intrude in time and in history with judgment. We are now living in an age of grace. We're living in the church age. And God, he allows a lot to go on. It's not. Judgment is going to be poured out upon the earth. And you know, one day, if you don't know Christ, you will be judged. If you know Christ, your judgment's already been taken on the cross. He's taken it all for you. You see, God graciously warns, flee the wrath to come. I told you a story once before about the Baptist minister and the Catholic priest. That church was right across the road from each other. And they were outside with a sign, and the sign said, Repent, for the end is near.
cars would go by, they'd heckle at them, you know, drive them by and say, well, you guys are just religious crazies out there. And finally, the, the Catholic priest says to the, the Baptist minister, said, hey, maybe we should change the sign to, to read, turn around, bridge out ahead. <laughs> you see, getting the warning. Got to get the warning, the warning. God graciously warns for us to flee from wrath to come, all right? Consequences of rejecting the warnings are severe. If a person does not receive Christ and Christ returns, it is going to be going into a period of severe consequences. Imagine, I get up and I'm preaching, telling you about the rapture, that Christ is coming back, and I'm pleading for you to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you don't really know him. And you say, I can put it off, and then boom. It happens. It happens. Then what? Then I'm the one that's left behind for a terrible time that Jesus said is unequaled. Time never been like this before. Never, ever will be again. Oh, I'll take my chances. Not me. I received Jesus Christ as my Savior, you see, because after that, you step into that period of time, your faith will cost you your life. If it doesn't, you probably got the imposter. You're believing in the imposter. And the imposter's going to say, oh, no, you're okay. You're fine. You're fine. It's like the imposter today, today who's saying, oh, it's okay. You don't, it's all right if you don't have Jesus. No, it's not all right. Oh, all people are going, all faiths lead to the same end. No, they don't. No, they don't. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Imposters always give a false message that you're okay. You see, today is the day of God's salvation. Today is the day. You know how I know that? It tells me right in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. I don't know if you know Jesus as your Savior. You may know a lot about him, but this is not knowing about him. Many will say on that day, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do this in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You knew about me, but you didn't know me. Big difference. You need to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, the word is so clear and so easy to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. I just confess with my mouth that he is Lord, and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. For with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And anyone who calls on the name of the Lord like that will be saved. So, Lord, I ask, the person here is questioning, do I really know him, or is it just that I know about him? That right now they would just lift up a prayer, say, Lord, I want to know you. I'm a sinner. Save me from my sins. I confess you as my Lord, my Savior, my God. Save me, Lord Jesus. We know, Lord, a sincere heart, truly repentant and believing, will bring salvation from wrath to come. Thank you, Lord, for any who's prayed that prayer just now and become a child of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.